this is a city of mixture. From, for, Western, for Westerners, this is East. For Easterners, it is West. For us, this is home, and in different home, we cannot live. There are very few places in the world which are like this. Various pla very few places in which you can hear the voice of Muezzin, the bells of the churches, and see Jews going to the synagogue. Maybe now one can understand why somebody wanted to destroy it. If you see the Austro-Hungarian modern Islamic living all together. Because this is a sign that various people with various cultures, with various languages, with various religions can blend and live together. Ashtachavu Adonai Bechadrat Kodesh Adonai Lamavu Yashar Veashev Adonai Melech Leola Adonai Yos Lamo Ishtabach Veitapar Veitromach Veitnashe Veitkadar Veitale What really struck me about the Jews of Bosnia and these emaciated people who had been through all these dangers weren't emotional about it at all. Somehow they had absorbed within themselves the loss of Spain 500 years ago, the losses during World War II, the disintegration of the country they'd lived in for 50 years, war that had come to Bosnia, and you go there now, or if you go when they're all together with their Jews from other parts in the region, and they will sing. <laughs> In the Song of, so Song of Songs, uh, the beloved is compared to a nut tree. And in one of the interpretations, the rabbi said, Jews are nuts. Now, they didn't mean crazy, they meant nuts. Why? Because they're all interrelated, and if you take one away, they're all affected. And it was true, because Jews around the world were concerned about what was going to happen. And the truth is, everyone was expecting the Jews to be scapegoated. And if not by one side, maybe by all three sides. And quite the contrary. Not only are we not being scapegoated, we're receiving tremendous help and cooperation. for 400 years was the heart of Jewish presence in Sarajevo. 
hard because for 400 years Jews lived here, concentrating here, and these walls here can remember more than, than it's written. 50 families lived here for 300 years, and these are the only, the only remnants of that. It became a Jewish museum in 1966, and till now, it's a Jewish museum. Till now, meaning till 1992, till the beginning of this war, because in the war, it was closed, not da damaged, but not heavily, and after the war, so everything what belonged to City Museum is now stored here. So this was called Cal Vieju in Ladino, Old Temple. The next one, although it, it is almost 300 years old, it's Cal Nuevo, New Temple. This building was just one among eight synagogues of Sarajevo, seven Sephardi and one Ashkenazi. Ivica Inyaki said to us, look, the Jews of Sarajevo enjoy a very strange position. We're trusted by the Muslims, by the Croats, and by the Serbs, even though none of them trust each other. And we have, since 1892, a cultural and humanitarian aid organization called La Benevolencia. La Benevolencia, it's an uh, old Spanish wall or Ladino wall for goodwill. And this is the name of a Jewish cultural and humanitarian organization which was established in 1892 in Sarajevo. To be quite honest, the organization was established by the Sephardic Jews, but uh, they have been inspired by Ashkenazi Jews who arrived with Austro-Hungarian Empire. And then the Sephardic Jews from Sarajevo discovered that it's very good to be educated, to finish some high schools, and to work as a civil servant for the government. On these walls are names of 10,000 Sarajevans who were killed in the Second World War. Victims and partisans together. Victims and Jews together, because I'm always separating the word victim of the war and victims of the Holocaust. Names, names of Sarajevans who perished between 1941 and 1945, put here in alphabetical order. But if you see, if you observe carefully, you see that here are representatives of all present nations, Muslims, Croats, Serbs, Jews, Gypsies, unified, all of them unified as victims. But this was maybe the most monumental monument of Second World War in whole former Yugoslavia. 10,000, more than 10,000, sorry, were Jews perished in Second World War. 7,000 of them were killed, but 3,000 came back survivors, but survivors mainly due to help of their neighbors who helped them in 1941 to escape from here. And neighbors who helped them were mainly Muslims. There are many stories amongst uh, survivors, surviving Sarajevo Jews still alive who can with, uh, with a great warm, uh, warmth and passion and love mention names of their neighbors and friends, sometimes even unknown people who cover them in, a, in a Muslim costumes to cover their faces put them on trains or took them by, by their cars. During the period of socialism in this country, I think that uh, it's fair to say that uh, Jewish life was quite normal. Naturally, it was forbidden to have any association uh, with the uh, national predomination. I think that more than 80% of our members are in the mixed marriages. But instead of losing our members, 
I think that we are getting new members, including my wife. She converted a long time ago, just to make clear that our children will be raised as Jews. I met my husband in 1966 at the Slobodan Amatorial Dramatic Theater. We went out for three years, and then we got married. My Muslim parents already had a daughter who was married to a Serb. So it didn't come as a shock for them when I decided to marry a Jew. After many years, we're still together. It turned out to be a good match. One morning we woke up under shelling. And then it, everything started. city was rounded, part of the city over the, uh, across the river was occupied by Serbs, and this became the isle, completely encircled, inner circle government of Bosnia and Herzegovina with army, which still uh, didn't exist, which was underforming, middle circle of UN, which was wandering around, mainly doing nothing, being nervous, but not knowing to do what to do, and outer circle of GNA and Ser Serbs shooting down. And this is the beginning of the Sniper Alley. Here, behind the Holiday Inn, where the huge army barracks, in which a couple of units of Yugoslav army were encircled by Bosnians, so we had siege under siege. And this was the only communication. So whoever lived on the western part of the city and had to come here, was forced to drive aside the, the barrack. Between 1992 and 1995, before the Dayton Agreement was signed, the place we are standing by right now was the most dangerous place in the world. Today, standing here after seven years, this place still evokes very strong emotions in me. I can see that our parliament hasn't even been rebuilt. Behind me you can see the view of Sarajevo. One was living under the uncomfortable sensation of being watched all the time. We continually felt like moving targets. It was impossible to hide anywhere. Here, where we are standing now, was one of strong points during the siege of Sarajevo. Strong points which covered almost the entire middle third of the city. You see, the front line was here, just a couple of hundred meters down the hill. All houses were destroyed, and from here, this part of the city was covered. Everything was covered, and everything was hit. Somebody showed me some kind of statistics which says that average daily portion of grenades, uh, grenades which, uh, which city got was about 2,000 per diem. This is the cemetery of Sephardim of Sarajevo. 
one of the oldest cemeteries in the area, 400, almost 400 years old cemetery, which paid a heavy price in this war. Here, first were Serbs shooting down, then Bosnians came on the other side of, the, of that, uh, that wall, then for a year they fought over the cemetery, then Serbs withdraw, then this was no man's land, and then at the end, everybody withdrew and abandoned this. Our front was two or three kilometers behind Serbian lines. This is because the cemetery had become one of the strategic points of their offensive. It was of vital importance for us to free the cemetery in order to prevent the snipers from shooting onto the city. But the feeling that people were killed from here will never leave us. The news which came every single day, there were two persons killed from Jewish cemetery. There were 10 people killed from Jewish cemetery. People were killed from shells who came, which came from the Jewish cemetery, will not be erased from the memory of this city. No, no matter the Jews that do not have anything to do with that. No matter with that. People were killed from here and this will not be forgotten. The fact that this place used to be a strong point for our enemies has always greatly saddened me. Anyone who values and respects life should not have used this sacred ground as a war zone, especially not as a place from which to shoot at the innocent people of Sarajevo. When you look at the stones, you see scars, and those scars will remain forever. Damage, uh, damage on buildings will be repaired, wounds on flesh will pass, but wound, uh, wounds on the stones, wounds on the tombstones will never pass. This is memento forever. The soul of Bosnia, the soul of common life, of life of Jews, Christians and Muslims has deep scars. It got scars in every war which passed through here, and there were many wars. But may, this war may be left the deepest scars, and I'm not sure that during my lifetime, this generation, that they will pass. So the question was what to do, to go or to stay. We had very limited financial resources. But uh, first, humanitarian associations uh, moved from, uh, from Croatia to Bosnia in the, at the end of the fall of 91, in the beginning of the winter of 92, offering some kind of symbolic help because nobody, nobody could predict that something so disastrous will happen here.
Dođi vama, pitan se da se uopće. Nešto. Malo. This is Ramis, my friend for 25 years. We work together and a lot of other stuff which is not for, for publishing. And this is his grandchildren, grandchild, his wife, his family. So this is a part of the world which very few of those who will who will see this will understand. This is a small, small Muslim enclave squeezed between Serbs and Croats during all the war. Instead of living peacefully like they lived for all their history, they were, they were killed by both sides. All, all of those people lived here and were killed by their neighbors and former friends. So, do you usually serve coffee to the most handsome first? No, no, you're a regular here. <laughs> you know that we consider you one of us. I should hope so. You know you are. Show us how old you are again. Show them. How was the other way? <laughs> <laughs> she showed me how, uh, how many years she has showing fingers. But here is a problem. If you show like this, it's a sign of Serbs. So she is taught to do like this, not to be mixed with other nationalities. <laughs> he decided to go to Sarajevo, 50 kilometers away from here, under the fire, to ask a relief, a help from us not from somebody who is closer to him, who could be, say, who could be called his, not to me, to the member of the nation which was technically on the other side, because everybody said that we were friends of Serbs, not of others. Here we can see the two of you during the war. Here are two of us in the war when he came on foot 50 kilometers from here to get, to get relief from the Jewish community. How could I possibly not remember what you did for me? You were the first friend who gave me some money in order to get by during the war. I don't want to talk about it. And the only one who... I would rather not talk about it. How were you able to make it through the checkpoints to go to Sarajevo? I went through the tunnel. How did you reach the tunnel? Through the Igman mountain. How long did the journey take? Oh. At least seven hours, at least. It must have taken longer than that. I left early in the morning. The problem started once I reached the tunnel. What was the most terrible thing you saw during the war? I saw many, but I can't describe them. I looked at death in the face on Mount Treskavica. So? They'd killed my commander. We were isolated for one day and one night until others arrived to help us. I didn't think we'd get out of there alive. I can no longer find my place in life. I've returned here in the place where I was born. I found my family. But even this can't make things go back to the way they were. I was scared to stay home alone with the children. 
I had two little girls, and the most normal thing that could happen to us was that of being slaughtered. I was especially afraid for them. Today I can walk with my head held high. I've never committed a crime. I've always avoided going against a weaker enemy. Can they say the same thing? Not everyone can, but let them be ashamed of their atrocities. That's the way it is. Everyone is responsible for his own actions. Would you have survived without the other's help? No. No, no. Living here was too hard. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Okay, that's enough. It was very interesting when I was on Women Congress in Jerusalem in November '94, and uh, on uh, last last uh, evening dinner, I had a speech to congratulation congratulate uh, Mr. Itzhak Rabin on Nobel uh, Prize. <laughs> They introduced me to Mr. Itzhak Rabin because I am relative of Dado El Azar and he said, oh, welcome to Israel, you will stay in Israel. I told him, oh no, thank you very much, but uh, I must to come back in Sarajevo. I'm, I'm busy in Jewish community, they need my help. And he said, but there is very danger. I told him, yes, he's danger, but if I my destiny to kill me, they will kill me. That was November 94. November 96, somebody killed him, unfortunately. Uh, when war starts, I came to visit my mother, who lived two tram stations far from my house, and uh, because she was uh, old and sick, I decided to spend with her two days. And when I came at her house, uh, my uh, uh, area where is my apartment was occupied and I couldn't come back home. And uh, in one day, I lost my house, I lost my job. I moved, I moved to my sister's house and go to, to Ivica, Cherashnyash in, in Jewish community, to tell him, Give me some job. I like to work. I, 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 I'll become crazy. I, I have so, so much problems. I, I must be active. And he said to me, okay, uh, all ladies from a women club leave Sarajevo. 
is necessary again organize Bibin Club. Gave them a name, La Bohoreta, that nickname of first Sephardi intellectual lady. We try to, 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 stay, in, to stay normal in that abnormal conditions. And uh, I decide to organize one small hairdress and uh, makeup uh, salon and the ladies uh, made some, uh, some clothes. So women organize themselves. They organize their home visits for those who couldn't come. They organize distribution of clothes or clothing which were, which were coming. They, all, they started to organize a cultural work. <laughs> We has uh, uh, much more members, and we try to look nice, to be clean, with clean hair, with makeup, to dress dress nice. But uh, everybody had a tr uh, tennis shoes that we can running past the street when, when they're shooting. Adio, adio. One month after the war began, there was nothing left. People were hungry, and we had to give them something to eat. We went out and took what was in the garden. But there was hardly anything left in the garden. Some herbs, maybe, something that could be chewed. I even asked the people who lived in the country which herbs could be eaten without causing harm. The people who came here were always very frightened, but to avoid making them think about the war, I made them laugh. I put rock music on and banned political conversations in the restaurant. I also banned listening to the news. So here, there was no fear. It was like an oasis of peace. We began to collect donations and goods and the idea that the small Jewish community of Sarajevo could help all of its neighbors began to capture the imagination of many people around the world. But there was a big, big problem, problem of communication. Sarajevo was surrounded. No, there was no possibility for to communicate without the world. One day, a man came to my office and he said, I'm Swedish. My name is Ingmar Lindgren. I heard what we are doing, and I came to help. I asked him, who are you? What can you do? What do you know to do? He said, I'm a teacher of violin. I said, look, the last thing I need in the war here, he's a teacher of violin. But as he said, I can do whatever I want. And I noticed that around his neck is hanging a UN ID. And I asked him, uh, can you use UN flights? He said, yes, of course, I came by UN plane. I said, okay, you are my mailman. From that day, started to fly out of Sarajevo to our logistics center in Split, taking out first dozens, then hundreds, and then hundreds of thousands of letters. From Sarajevans to their relatives outside, and from their relatives outside, in. During the war, everybody knew that the Jewish community was very active. It was only thanks to their work that many people were able to receive mail and parcels. 
It was the only possible way of breaking the embargo that had been imposed on the city. This help lifted the spirits of the people who had stayed here to fight. this segment here, which you will see as a first aid ambulance. And this developed itself as something, the most, uh, as the most critical part of our work. Everybody, almost everybody from in the city came here because it was opened to all population. Oh, sorry. From this place was organized the most important thing, the house calls during the war. House calls which were made under the fire, which were made in all kinds of uh, in all kinds of difficulties, and the people, many people literally survived thanks to this. So we organized a small team made up of a few doctors and nurses. And during those difficult years, we were running through the streets. Since we had to have everything with us at all times, we were carrying bags that weighed 15 to 20 kilos on our shoulders. Once on the road, we could no longer return to the base. Usually we were taken to the address furthest away and slowly made our way back to Benevolencia by foot. We did this day after day. No one ever asked us why we were helping everyone, Jews and non-Jews alike. During the war, the need of medical help was immense, and we never made any distinctions. People who are not in the Jewish community are still calling us today, asking if they can come for checkups. I would like to know if, during the war, people felt embarrassed about having to ask Jews for help. No, no. This emergency room was famous in the whole city. As at the time, it was the only one which had a pharmacy with many supplies that had been donated from abroad. Here, Everyone could find what they needed. During the war, people tried to stick together by helping each other in any way they could. Everything was shared. Stolen electricity, water, wood to keep warm. New gas pipelines were improvised. They were certainly inconsistent with all the security standards and norms, but they worked. Basically, everything was reduced to two questions. Where to and who, who will be the first? Who will be the first to use the small amount of water we had? And that's it. Everything went backwards. In a, matter, in a question of in a matter of civil, civilized behavior and relation among people, among sexes, among groups, everything was really, really pushed down and backwards. the Croats in Herzegovina fighting the Muslims 
and you had the Serbs fighting the Muslims and the Croats. And of course, the Muslim, and everyone was fighting each other. And at one point, the roads were, of course, blocked between the different zones. So no one was getting any supplies through. No one, that is, except the truck with the big blue menorah of La Benevolencia. And then Ivica Inyaki said to us, and if you will give us support, we can start to bring humanitarian supplies into Sarajevo for everyone. Please note that in that situation, we acted as the logistic headquarter for all the other organizations. Catholic, Muslim or secular ones, they were all using our services. I used to work for the distribution of humanitarian help. We would prepare small baskets with food for those who needed it. Out here, in front of the building, the line was very long. Then was it right to help everyone, even the Muslims? This is the way to do it. In such a way, we live our lives. Ivica and his colleagues in Sarajevo were then able to organize the first buses of Jews and non-Jews to come out of Bosnia, come out of Sarajevo, to the Dalmatian coast, into Croatia. On our way from here to Split, which is on the coast, and it, do, it is not more than 300 kilometers, you should pass through 38 checkpoints during the war. Uh, held by four armies, six militias. On some of these checkpoints, uh, we behave almost like James Bond, trying to find out first who is in front of you, and after that, to pull from the right pocket the right document. If you miss the pocket, you can be killed on the spot. During that period, we organized ourselves in order to obtain documents for Muslim and Croat citizens. We managed to get hold of them through some police officers, old friends of mine. And I remember that one young Muslim couple ask me may I, if I may provide just names. And I gave them the names of my late mother and father. So in some of these lists of Jews evacuated from Sarajevo in 1992, you can find the name of my late mother and father who passed away 10 years before the war. That he put us with this bullshit that we during the night passing the most dangerous place of Russia. That we have guarantee from Croatian government. We have guarantee from Serbian That we have guarantee from Interfor. And now they make me problem that in four hours I cannot pull three buses. And I tell to him, if you want to solve this problem, come here. Serb held territory. Now comes five kilometers of no man's land and then Croatian held territory. In that famous convoy of November 1992, we drove six buses uh, and 15 private cars through here. We were allowed to leave, to leave the Soviet territory to go down to Croatia one and through Croatia to split. Ivica, being head of the convoy, traveled down with the buses. 
They went through, but at one of the checkpoints, the bar came down in front of my eyes, and I remained behind. When we came down to the creation checkpoint, we, since the road is curved, I suddenly realized that almost half of the convoy is missing. Five buses with mixed Jews, Muslims, and the Serbs were there, but one Croatian bus and 15 private cars were missing. Here is where the real problem started. The Serb irregular forces, with long beards and hair, arrived with their beautifully polished armaments and long knives. They started dragging people out of their cars. They checked me three or four times. I lost it and said, well, are you letting me through or not? So I started to run back through the dark, but since it was five kilometers, suddenly somebody appeared from the dark. It was one of my workers who put me in the car and brought me here. And here was a carnage. The Serbian irregular stopped that part, started to pull people out. In that instant, I saw Ivica all sweaty and running towards us. He seemed very worried. I had never seen him like this. So I jumped back in the carnage and tried to fight, start to fight for everybody, for, for the bus, which was purely Croatian, and they obviously intended to kill everybody there. They started to pull people out. There was some blood, there were some beatings. I stopped it for a second, and they used that second, just the confusion of that second, to ask, is, there, is everything all right? They said, it is and it is not. You are taking Turks out. Turks meaning Muslims. I said, yes, I'm taking Turks out, but that's the price for your people whom I'm taking out. And one by one, one by one, it lasted about half an hour. Convoy were left, and I stayed alone back. I learned personally very early on, somebody comes to you and they need help. You have to be there at that moment to help. Otherwise, go to hell. Don't waste my time. Either you're going to help me or you're going to leave me alone. Get out of my way. Why? Because these people are desperate. Do you remember the Jewish convoy? I don't know. There were so many. They all looked the same. In 1992, they stopped us right here. My God, there were so many. You think that an old granny can remember them all? It was not my intention to. It's okay. I just cannot remember. Our six convoys passed right through here. I'm a Jew. Yeah. Don't you remember? No, I really don't. But even a granny can remember if she wants to. No, she can't. I am illiterate. I can only read a few words, but I really don't remember. Everyone knew about it when it was a Jewish convoy, because in the end they always let it through. But I don't know these things. Mm.